Let me take a second to say thank you, the two most important words in the English language. Thank you first to the Mombeck family. Betsy, Matt, Mike, Andy and Mike, <laughs> Sherry. Um, we are so honored. And to the event staff, right? Where's my girl, Sarah? <laughs> Terry, of course, who accosted me at my book signing at Books Can Co. last year and said, would you do this? And I was like, you're damn right I will. <laughs> um, I am, we are both so honored and so thrilled. Uh, we hope what we said in our workshop is helpful. We'll tell it uh, a little differently now and um, add all the salty flavor that we couldn't say when we were trying to teach you stuff. <laughs> But thank you so much. Uh, that was lovely what you said. I think th the evolution of this column and this second career for us both is, th it was Irma. I mean, I must tell you, I've been writing mysteries forever. And I started writing mysteries with strong female protagonists because frankly, I missed Nancy Drew. And I said, where are all, like, why in so much in crime fiction, which was true 25 years ago when I started, that it was like a guy doing cool and interesting things and the girl. And I thought, you know, we, we can play too. And then there came along a guy named John Grisham. You may have heard of him. Um, and he wrote stories about male lawyers. And I'm like, well, I'm a female lawyer. Like, can I try this when my amazing daughter was born and I got a divorce at the same time, which I do not recommend. Don't try this at home. It's only for really bad planners. I, that doesn't sound right. You know what I mean. <laughs> I started to write those stories. And then what happened to me at midlife, which was about 55 years ago, and my, I looked at the newspaper, which I dearly love, and I said, I miss Irma Bombeck that we are all so well informed on politics and all the stuff in the economy, but where is the stuff of family? Like, where is the stuff that makes me laugh? Because the real truth is that at the end of the day, it's all about her. It's all about my mother and my brother. It's all about who is at our tables, right? At dinner. So I want to write that. Now, I will tell you that having said that I was so inspired by Irma, I felt distinctly at a disadvantage because I lack her talent. <laughs> and the other thing I lack, which she had, was so much because she was so much the story of a mother and a family, right? That's why it's so, I'm so honored that you're here. And I'm so honored to be here with you, we both are. Because it was about a family, and I didn't have the normal family. Like, I'm divorced twice from thing one and thing two. <laughs> and I felt that acutely, that we're, and I'm a single mother, and she's an only daughter. In fact, at one point she said to me, when she was little, if you're an, a single mom, does that make me a, what is it, if you're an only mom, what was the most line? I don't remember it, but you, you told me, I said, if I'm an only child, are you an only mother? And I said, yes, I'm an only mother, because you're an only child. <laughs> like, who, that's perfect. And I felt weird wishing that I could write this, but feeling so odd. I felt and sometimes feel so odd because I don't have a husband or all the normal stuff you're supposed to have. And I felt bad about that. And so then I happened to be speaking at a library fundraiser, because I love libraries, and that was in Laguna Niguel, which is a very cool and gorgeous place in, uh, on the West Coast. And I didn't always say out loud that I'm divorced twice, and I sort of mumbled it. And somebody said, um, oh, honey, I'm divorced three times. And I'm like, you know, maybe. And then someone else said, I'm divorced four times. And someone else said, I'm divorced five times. And then I start to talk to these women who are so wonderful and sharing. And they go, you know what? I have three dogs. I'm like, well, I have four dogs. And I'm starting to understand that there is a relationship between these things. <laughs> that what is happening, I don't want to say we're replacing our husbands with dogs, because obviously that would never happen. What I really think is happening is this, that what I came to understand from these women is something that is a really true thing, which is you get the life, you get a life. And you must live it. And God, how lucky you are to be in the game. And so you make yourself happy however you can. And if it means, like me, that you'll end with an awesome kid, no husband, but happily nobody to tell you that you can't have any more dogs, you will buy dogs. You will rescue dogs. You will kiss them on the lips. And ain't it great? I have. And that's why I was like, either from all of this, I learned that either I should move to Laguna Niguel or I'm really behind in the divorce count because I have five dogs and only two divorces. 
But what happened that day is I said to myself, if the message of Irma was anything, because she was really so ahead of her time, that's why those books still stand today. That's why that's still funny, because it was classic and true and forever evergreen. And I said, if her message was just tell your truth, right? Because she told it at a time when no one was telling it. I can go, well, gee, that she, I want to do it because she did it. But she was the original. And so I said, all right. So after that Laguna Niguel thing, I said, go home and give it a try. Um, I went to the Inquirer. I said, you need, well, A, you need some women's voices. And B, you need somebody to make people laugh because have you seen the economy lately? <laughs> and so they said, OK, if we let you do this, will you shut up? I said, possibly. And so I started to write the column. The column is the stuff of, I think, a woman's life. It led to the book, which is uniquely my life, and the title, Why My Third Husband Will Be a Dog. <laughs> like, if you title a book like that, you're never, you're going to be selling it forever, ever, ever. That's the end of your dating life. <laughs> you know, in my thrillers, I write sex scenes, and I write them from memory. <laughs> and now I don't remember. Great, great. Sorry. <laughs> Off topic, possibly. In any event, I said, what am I going to write about? We're going to write about family. You're going to tell it real, because no matter what you're writing, everybody, you're going to tell it true. And it has to be really true. And it's going to make you cringe. And if it makes you cringe, you know that's exactly what you should be writing. And if your family is as crazy and wacky and unconventional as mine, excluding this present company, <laughs> she's like the same one, I call us the Flying Scottolinis. And I write, for example, about my mother. How apropos today for a number of reasons about which you will find out. Here is a story about my mother. My mother, for almost all her life when we grew up, went to live with my brother in Miami because it's warm and it's also fun. Like I said, you could live with me. And she said, all you do is read and write. You're very boring. I was like, I know. It's like my life's dream to read and write. But that's all right. I live like a nun. Where did it go? Um, she lives with my brother. One morning, she wakes up in Miami. This happened about five years ago. She is sure she has felt an earthquake. She goes and wakes up my brother, Frank. There has been an earthquake. He said, Ma, it's Miami. She's like, I know there has been. She goes across the street to the neighbor and wakes him up. There has been an earthquake. He's like, Mary, it's Miami. She goes inside, and for a reason we will never understand, she calls the Miami Herald. The Miami Herald, major metropolitan newspaper, is her personal 911, and she calls them up. I would like to report a hurricane, uh, an earthquake. They're like, lady, it's Miami. She said, tell me your name, because she takes names. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you remember the list, she's got the list. Not the things to do list, the other list. <laughs> she takes down his name angry. He takes down her name, probably thinking this woman's going to stalk me someday. They both hang up the phone. It ends up being a very good thing they took each other's names, because five minutes later, he calls her back. He says, Mary Scottolini, there has been an earthquake. She's like, I know. I tried to tell you there was an earthquake, and you called me crazy. But what happened is, amazingly enough, that the earthquake did not take place in Miami. It took place in Tampa, Florida. Do you know anything about Florida geography? One's way up and one's way down. My mother was the only person in South Florida who felt it, and so that's why they sent a news van to the house. They pull up to the house. They interview my mother. My mother is on the TV screen, and underneath it says, Earthquake Mary. This she loves. <laughs> right? She is in her full glory. My brother, who, by the way, is gay, so that means he's a lot more fun than I am. And at that point, I must admit that he was in a little bit of a... There were some unfortunate wardrobe choices during that era of his life. <laughs> And so he was big into the mesh t-shirt. Oh, yes. The better to see the map of Italy on his chest. You will not be surprised that that's how we roll in the Scottolinis. So he it comes on camera, and you can see him lurking in the background, showing you pecs and tats. Great. But they interview my mother, and they bring the microphone to her face, and they say, how is it? You can Google this later, or you can read it in the book. Whatever you do, this is every word of this true. You Google Mary Scottolini Miami and earthquake, and you will get what she told the reporter when he said, how is it that you are the only person in South Florida who felt this earthquake? And she will say, because I know these things. <laughs> they run screaming from the lawn, right? That is my mother. That's what I want to write about. 
you know, I think that natural force aspect to her is not unique to the Flying Scottolinis, is it? Aren't all of us, to a certain extent, wasn't Irma Bombeck a natural force? But with better manners. <laughs> My mother was in Florida, and there was going to be a big hurricane. I said, listen, you've got to come north, because she's 4'11", and you could blow away. Like, I kind of, I want you up north. She's mad about that. Ah, she's so mad. I think of her as Yosemite Sam, because she's, she's so a little cranky. Boom, boom, tarnation, boom. I make her get on the plane. I make her fly up. Of course, she gets off the plane, and for some odd reason, there's a, there's a TV guy there, too, because it actually was such a big hurricane, I forget the name, that they're flying everybody up, and everybody's mother's all pissed, and they get off the phone. She's off the plane. He brings the microphone to her face. He said, why is it? Did you fly up because you were afraid of the hurricane? She's like, I'm not afraid of a hurricane. I am a hurricane. <laughs> now, do you understand what I'm telling you? Do you understand what I'm telling you? And I thought to myself, there is humor in this. There is pathos in this. There is love in this. Like, Sharon, that was so nice of you, what you said. And that is the stuff of real life. And like Francis Ford Coppola says, everything, nothing in my movies really happened, but all of it is true. Every, I write fiction for 20 years, I write nonfiction for five. I can tell you that I do the same thing every time. I try to tell the truth, ironic in fiction, and I try to make it funny. And my family hands me the material. Not always is the material funny. Not always is the situation funny. But the great thing about the human heart is that it finds the humor in the situation. Let me share with you a sad thing, because right where Francesca and I are now is that my poor mother was diagnosed with cancer last week. She entered hospice at my house. She is there now. Brother Frank is there, better dressed. <laughs> uh, it, of course, comes at the middle, right when you have a new book out and you're going to go on book tour. I will tell you, this is the last event for us. We would not have missed this. We are going, flying home today, and I'm canceling the rest of the tour because we are needed there, and that's where I want to be. But let me tell you about that, because the great thing about humor is it happens. This is the worst, this is the worst thing. This is a very bad circumstance, right? We know this. I'm not going to bore you and tell you I love my mother. I love my mother. Every book will tell you I love my mother. Barbara King Solver says, if you want to know me, read me. You will see the soul. That's, what, that's why the books matter, and that's why the arts matter. But what is happening at my house now is a source of unbelievable sadness, but unbelievable humor. I'll tell you a story. My mother, as you have seen, right, is a hurricane, is a fighting spirit. So she's not really accepting this diagnosis with a lot of aplomb. In fact, we can't spell aplomb in the Scottolini family. We just fight our way on. So basically what happens is uh, my brother says, listen, if she's coming towards the end, we should get a priest because it, in her later life, she has become more religious, which I'm like, who are you kidding? No one has set, no one has set foot in a church in my family like since the omen. And basically, uh, he said, well, she watches it on TV on Sunday. Well, I'm not sure that counts. Yeah, she watches mass. It was funny because I said, really? I mean, he says, yeah, it's a nice half hour mass. I said, well, in Philly, it's an hour and a half. So are you in for it that long? Like, how much do you love God? Because you're going to be sitting. <laughs> they DVR mass, yes. <laughs> They DVR masks because they don't want to get up early to watch it. That's the level, the level of commitment to God in the Scottolini family. Are you impressed yet? So basically what happens is we decide to call the priest. So then uh, the priest, in his goodness, decides to come and visit. Well, my mother spies him out the window. And a look crosses her face. I'm like, this isn't good. What's going to happen bad? And she says to me, is that a priest? I go, yes. She says, a priest? Never! <laughs> now, this happened three days ago. Now, what I'm saying to you is this. My mother, her whole life, said no. She tends to be a little contrary, which is about part of her vim, her life force. And now no has morphed to never. And if you're in terminal care, like, never has a real import. You know, like, she means, like, never say never. She's saying never, and it's going to be never. There's never going to be a priest. I have to go out on the lawn because I'm the peacemaker, also the lawyer, because the price is right. And I say to this priest, listen, I know that we invited you, but this hysterical woman right now that's pointing at the driveway and saying, get the hell out of here, like that would be my mom. <laughs> and I hope you understand, and he does, but then we are given a hard problem because I'm worried that she's going to change her mind because that's something else we do. And so then I have to call the same priest and listen, how can I get some holy water 
and can I Google what to do? <laughs> he actually tells me we don't call it last rites anymore, we call it the sacrament of healing. I'm like, do you think a woman from South Philly is gonna buy the sacrament of healing? <laughs> you are new around here. So in any event, that's how that goes. The darkest moments, because they're full of life, yield humor. And it's hard for me, but wonderful for both of us, because I've spent my life, like much of you, and this is what I write about too, in the sandwich generation, right? We're in the middle. I have an amazing kid on one side and an amazing mother on the other. Sometimes it's combustible. <laughs> Here's a perfect example that I think is emblematic. Then I'll turn this over to Francesca, who will do more than you know, gaze adoringly at me. I will gaze it. We're like married now. It's great. Maybe this one will work. Um, <laughs> Francesca is home visiting. And she is sitting at the kitchen island, and she is reading women's magazines we love. We love to read. We read, we read cereal boxes. Where's the people who read cereal boxes? Yes, of course. Riboflavin, what is it? <laughs> um, so she's reading. She says, Mom, do you realize it says here that you should change your razor every three to five uses? Yes, we're going there. You should, you should throw away your plastic razor every three to five uses. How often do you throw away your razor? I'm like when it gets rusty, <laughs> okay? Like, if there's orange streaks from my armpit, I know it's probably time to give up the ghost. Too much? We're getting separated. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, how weird is this? So anyway, at this point, my mother comes downstairs, and she, I know this is a funny mama, because I say, Mom, you know, Francesca is reading this magazine, and it says you should throw your razor away every three to five uses. How often do you sh throw your plastic razor away? And she goes, I don't have any more hair to shave. And I go, great. See, <laughs> so you thought you would learn at this workshop, and here you are. When you're 85, you don't even need a plastic razor. But what is the coolest thing is what she says next, because, of course, she gets mad again, because you remember she's Yosemite Sam. I am so mad, she says. I am so mad. It's also like, does your family have the thing where there's known sequiturs? Like you're talking about razors and then, this is what it reminds me of. Do you remember when you were little and there were the plastic cubes that, there were beads and they fit together because the little pop thing. Okay, there would be red and yellow and blue and green. That's how my family talks. That's the conversations of my family. Like, what, yellow? Okay. So. She is saying, I'm so mad. I go, what are you mad about, Mom? The razors? No, I'm mad because in Miami, she's mad, like, you know, she's mad for the tri-state area in general. Um, <laughs> I am mad because in Miami, my colander broke. It was a colander. You remember that colander? It was shaped like this. They all are. Um, <laughs> but we work with this. Uh, and it, all this, the dots were in the shape of stars, and they had little feet. I go, yeah, I, I remember that colander. And I'm starting to think, I, I remember that colander. And she goes, the foot broke off the colander. I was like, wait a minute. If I remember the colander and I'm 58, that means it's probably a 55-year-old colander. <laughs> so I bring this up to her, and she says, I know, but I paid good money for it. <laughs> so you see what I'm saying. And then when I think about this later, and I want to reflect on it, because I realize that's, and that was the heart of Irma to me, that there were moments in life, in domestic life, they're tiny. You can miss them. You can forget them. You might not notice their import because they happen so quick. And I must say on my cranky side that I think they're generally so disregarded by society as a whole that somehow that doesn't value these voices that are so much our voices. We say family matters, but I'm not sure that we always mean it. But in any event, I'm on a little campaign to really mean it. And so I thought this family moment was about much more than colanders and plastic razors. Isn't it, when you think about it? Isn't it about a woman's life? Isn't it about being in the middle of these two generations that are so disparate, so alike in so many ways, but so different in so many ways? That here is Francesca, who is taught by everything you're supposed to throw stuff away. Right? We had this conversation when I wanted to repair the TV set, and she's like, how are we going to do that? I'm like, well, we're going to find a TV repairman, and we looked, and we Google, and we're like, no, we're going to throw a TV away. But on the other hand is my mother, who doesn't expect anything to break. Because as Tom Brokaw is so right, that is the greatest generation. And I started to think about why don't they think, why doesn't she think anybody, anything will break? Because she never broke. 
because through hardship, through depression, through world war, I will add that my mother is the youngest of 19. Yes, we were really good Catholics at some point. <laughs> the youngest of 19. Two husbands, the first one died, and you probably can guess how. Um, <laughs> that she has lived through everything. She is unbroken. She remains unbroken. And so she is the kind of woman who will ask a priest to leave very politely. <laughs> Never. And that's, I think, the stuff of it. That's what I want. I want to leave. That's what I think when we talked after our session, so much of you are writing things like that. We heartily encourage you to add your voices to ours. It was Irma the start of that all. And Francesca will talk now about how she, uh, I, I want to say does the counterpoint, but that's a little too adversarial. OK, does the counterpoint. <laughs> Tells you the dirt. Go right for it. That's true. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you also from me for having us. This is such a fun thing. But yeah, how I got started was, I mean, much like my mom said, she sort of approached the Philadelphia Inquirer and said that you know, this was a voice that we wanted to hear, her voice, that, she, that we wanted to hear more of. And as she said, she was writing a lot about, about me. And my grandmother loves it because my grandmother loves the notoriety. She just like she's like Eva Perone, you know. She's just like, oh yes, me. But I, I'm reading it. And I'm like, I don't. I didn't say it like that. I, I don't. I don't sound like my voice doesn't sound like that. I mean, you couldn't hear the voice in the column, but I knew how she meant it. I knew how she was writing it. You know, like I could tell. So I, I was just sort of saying that to her, and we were having my that. Then in the beginning, it really was a counterpoint. And as I was saying that to her, she goes, you know, well. well Maybe, maybe you should contribute too. And when she went on tour and they weren't running anything, I just started submitting and it grew from there because we really realized that uh, the, the different perspectives were worthwhile. And it was interesting to sometimes see the ways that we were counterpoints when we never meant to be. I wrote a column um, about how I was finding myself getting really neurotic reading the wedding announcements in the New York Times. It was like, here I am, it's like, I consider myself a feminist and like well-educated young woman, and I'm reading it, I'm subtracting my age from the bride's age, I'm like, oh my god, okay, that's two years, there's only two years, I have to meet him, I would have to know him now, like I'd have to know him now. And I was like, who am I? I'm like a Jane Austen novel, like it was so depressing. And I realized, I'm, this, I mean, ultimately I realized that this was completely dumb and I busted myself on it. But then, totally not, pairing it up intentionally when we were putting uh, all of our essays together in the books because one thing is we don't write them together. I'm very so lucky that my mom, even though she's an incredible writer that I admire so much, she stays as my mom, not my editor, and she gives me that space to write on my own. So we really, we write them separately across state lines. This is the safest way to do it, other mothers and daughters. Um, and then we just sort of put them together. So then you see these parallels. So we were trying to find a place where we were going to put the one I had written about the wedding announcements. You see that my mom has one about being neurotic and crazy reading the obituaries. It's like, okay, <laughs> both of us need to calm down, okay? <laughs> like, you're way far away, away from the obituaries. I can just cool, slow my roll with the wedding announcements. It all happens when, you know, it's not our to choose. But so that's really how I got started. And I mean, my mom will say her favorite joke. Can I tell your joke? You tell What's the difference between an Italian mother and a Rottweiler? <laughs> Eventually, the Rottweiler lets go. <laughs> yeah, so, right? So, so it's been hard. I'm the only baby, and I had the gall to move out, right? Some parents are like, oh, my kid's failure to launch. I'm so worried. My mom's like, no. <laughs> she wanted me to go to school in Pennsylvania. She wanted me to stay in Pennsylvania. But I went to New York, which is a whole two hours away, which is just abandonment, like mother abandonment. I'd call CPS. Um, but I probably am responsible for this in part because I share a lot with you. We're very close, and it's a huge mistake on my part. I tell her way too much. Because I was like, when I first went to New York, it was my first year there, and uh, I, I went out with my friends to a bar, you know, like people, and just had one, one drink, like one. And I actually met a really nice guy. Like, when does that happen? That's seeing a white tiger in the wild. Okay, you met a nice guy at a bar who asked for your number for a dinner date. Right, so and he needed a good job, he was a lawyer, he happened to have gone to my mom's college, so I thought, like, she's gonna love this story, I can't even wait to tell it. So I gave her all the details, I oh, was so cute, he was like 6'4", and she's like, whoa, wait, wait, have you verified anything that he said? And I'm like, verified, like, what is that even, I was like, uh, no, but she was like, he could have told, he could tell you anything, you have no way of knowing, he said he's a lawyer, how do you know he's a lawyer? I was like, uh, I, well, so that she gets me like whipped into a frenzy. I'm on the phone with her Googling him. I find his most recent addresses to confirm that he lived in the states that he lived in. She actually had me find a, um, what's the? Entry of appearance. 
entry of appearance document to prove that he's a practicing lawyer because she immediately assumes he's out of work, he didn't pass the bar, forget it, he's full of crap. So I have to find all this stuff. I, I drew the line at the 1999 background check. Like she wanted the criminal background check. I said, you know, I'm just going for date. But I understand her worry. So I mean, we, we talked about street smarts, playing it safe. I'm open to that. Uh, we talked about meeting at the restaurant instead of my apartment, uh, letting my roommate know when to expect me, all these things. I'm, I'm on board. I'm on board. Thank you. What I forgot to tell her was, Mom, I'll call you when I get home. Ah, big mistake. Because, you know, New York is a little different. You have a 9 p.m. dinner. You go out a little later. So I, I was still out at 10.30 when she called me the first time. I just, I missed it. I didn't, I didn't hear the text chime in. And I didn't hear the next three texts chime in. And I, I swear, like, when we, we got a drink and we had this whole conversation about how it's so annoying when people check their phones, I missed the second call, too. I just totally didn't hear it. And, and then I, I confess, I did hear the third ring. But we were actually, it was the end of the night. It looked like you wanted to kiss me. And so I silenced the phone. <laughs> kiss of death, OK? <laughs> because I get back to my apartment. I'm all kind of like, hey, oh, I'm going to tell, maybe I'll tell her. I pick up the phone. I, I see I have three missed calls. And I start listening to these voicemails. And it is like. A picture in terror. It begins, <laughs> it begins normally enough. It begins like, hey, hon, just calling. No, I don't know if you're still out, but why don't you just give me a call when you get home? Just so I know you're home safe. OK, baby, love you. Bye. I love you. Bye. Always, it was like three byes. I don't know. Even in the voicemail, I don't understand. <laughs> then the next one is just a little, little higher. You know. Oh, uh, hey, you know, it's already 11.30, and I haven't heard from you, and I'm just feeling little, because I know you're not out now, because it's 11.30. So you're not out. You're not still out. It's a first date. OK. And I love you, and so call me back, because I love you. Bye. I love you. <laughs> The third one is at a pitch that only dogs can hear. Okay, it's like, hey, uh, uh, I haven't called me. I found out later she had emailed my roommate. She had emailed my friend. I'm like, oh my god, boundaries. Okay, I'm fine, okay. right? But I learned. I just have to learn how to handle her. And we've gotten a little bit about you. Selective with what I tell her. No, I'm just kidding. I tell you everything. I tell you everything. Um, but I, and some of it, I mean, again, this is. I guess I do give you some cause because there are some stories I tell her that. I know are probably not the stories that a mother wants to hear. Um, one, it was, it was happened recently, when, when, or a couple years ago, I guess, when my stepsister was coming to visit for her birthday. And I wanted to you know, show her New York. And so I wanted to show her everything that New York has to offer, all the sights. I wanted her to see the great restaurants, you know, go to fun shopping, see the you know, buildings and monuments. I didn't expect us to get this particular type of eyeful. But we were walking my dog at night after, after her birthday dinner. And all of a sudden, a man steps out from between two parked cars, and he is not dressed for the weather. <laughs> That's how long it. I immediately just spring into South Philly mode and go, ew, get away, you are disgusting. We don't want to see that. I'm going to call the police. I'm going to mace your. And he zipped up and zipped out. He definitely he got the message. My stepsister, she's almost six foot tall, redhead with big blue eyes. She looks like a lighthouse. She's like, was, was that his? Was he? And I go, yes, and yes. Disgusting. I'm so sorry you had to see that. And she goes, how did you react so fast? I said, oh, I know him. <laughs> I do. Uh, he's, uh, and I, and I don't know him, but he's my regular flasher. He's flashed me before, is all I'm saying. And uh, yes, yeah, so when you tell your mom you have a regular flasher, like, I get why she's worried. Um, <laughs> right. I, I mean, I, I see this guy. He clearly is in my neighborhood, or the, my neighborhood is his neighborhood of choice. And uh, I see him on these dog walks at night, which, which I hate, because I hate that he could never know that that's my routine. But I guess it's our routine. But um, <laughs> um, so one night, I see him, and I shot him down as usual, because that's my plan. I mean, I was raised right. So it's just like, let this person know that if he chooses me to mess with, the five boroughs will hear about it. Probably Mother Mary, Earthquake Mary will hear it. So um, I see him, I yell at him, he, he slinks away. And then, because I make a loop on a dog walk, you know, I do the little block square, I see him on another block. Only this time, he doesn't see me. He's across the street. So I instantly go, hey, I see you, buddy. I recognize you, you pervert. You get out of here before I call the police. I'm pretty sure it was him. I'm like 90% <laughs> sure it was him. Like, it, it's hard to tell with his pants up, but I'm pretty, pretty sure that it was him. And I mean, I'm, I'm a pro. I'm an old pro with the perverts, because like I said, it's not my first time with this guy flashing me, and he's not even my first flasher. Like, please, you are not my first flasher. You did not get there first. Um, the, the first time was so ironic because it was right near this super swanky restaurant that I live near that is lure me nameless, because I don't even want to give them the credit. But it's like the kind of ultra obnoxious restaurant where 
they are so exclusive, they don't have a listed number. If you want to make a reservation, you have to actually just go there and grovel in person and be like, please, can the plebeians eat here? Uh, I mean, unless you're the celebrity clientele, which I guess has them on speed dial, because I always, when I would walk the dog, see the paparazzi. I've seen like Madonna and her boy child boyfriend, I can't really tell, he's younger than me. Uh, you know, I've seen Hugh Jackman, I've seen a, I mean, unfortunately, the flasher is not Hugh Jackman, right? Because any amount of Hugh Jackman nudity is a public service. Man, woman, like, that I would be like, please. No, but so it was not one of the celebrities who flashed me. But I was actually, I was walking late at night. Um, actually, I was walking her little dog. She came to visit. And of course, she has to bring, like, a billion dogs that are barely house trained. So I was walking her little dog at 2.30 in the morning. And I see the uh, kitchen worker out. He's still in his kitchen uniform standing outside. And as I approach closer, he gives me a little dinner and a show, a little late night hand drive with the, his apron as a loincloth. And at that point, I was really just like intimidated and freaked out. I mean, it's very jarring and unpleasant. So I kind of just quickly ran away and went home. And I tell her about it in the morning, of course, because I have to guilt her. Like, I was walking your dog <laughs> when I was sexually harassed. And, <laughs> and I was really mad. And I, I had that George Costanza guilt of like I didn't say something to him. So I was extra mad because I just let it go. I was like, I should have think of all my good comebacks which I then get to write in the column. But, so my, my mom is likewise outraged. She's like, oh, it's disgusting. I feel bad, but not bad enough to give you really satisfaction about the guilt. But, <laughs> so I'm like, I'm gonna go to the manager of that restaurant today because he works there. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go talk to him. She's like, yeah, you should. Hey, maybe we'll get a free meal out of it. <laughs> I'm like, mom, he works in the kitchen. Do I need to make the joke? Like this is, apparently like the celebrity sightings are worth the risk of contamination. It's so revolting. Nobody go to this restaurant. So we, we go, and you know, the manager was appropriately disgusted. I could tell in his mind, he was just like, what if this happened to Beyonce? What if this happened to somebody who mattered? But I, like, I got it out of my system. You know, like, I got to feel a little satisfied that I had said something. And um, so yeah, so then it was like, I think this was the, I remembered fondly, the last time I saw my regular flasher. Um, I saw him, he did a little routine again, and I was just, I went into my routine again, but I was just so exhausted. I, so I was like, oh, please stop this. I don't want to see, I don't want to see anymore. And he actually said, sorry. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. <laughs> you know, I was like, I felt hurt. Like, men can't apologize, I finally felt hurt. So that night, you know, we both left satisfied, and it was just, it was nice. It was a nice moment, but. <laughs> Right? Yeah, exactly. But so I do, I do understand why sometimes she gets a little nervous. But, <laughs> right? But, yeah. You know, we're, I mean, we're a work in progress. Uh, but the, the time you were talking about with the TV it was an, a different time. More recently, I recently moved to a new apartment. And we were trying to hook up the, the TV. It wasn't working. And that's when you were like, oh, we'll get a repairman. And I was like, well, we find it in a fossil. I don't know what that is. <laughs> that does not exist. <laughs> She imagines like a little old timey, like, well, I live at the corner hardware store. Oh, I'll stop go it. <laughs> so um, I was like, no, that doesn't exist. Um, we have to, we, we'll have to buy, buy one. So she's just, well, we'll have to go to the Best Buy. But we had plans to see a movie, like some cute chick flick movie. And she was like, oh, but we won't be able to do, then we can't go to the movie. And I said, no. In New York City, the Best Buys are open 24 hours a day. And she was like, wow. And I love when I can like, show her like, cool New York stuff. Like, I, I, like I've grown up. I've accomplished something by living near a 24-hour Best Buy. <laughs> so she was really dazzled. It was incredible. So she's like, so we can go after the movie? And I was like, we can do anything we want. The city is ours. So, <laughs> so we can go. We have fun at the movie. Oh, wait, before we go, I'm sorry. How could I forget? She has to micromanage my outfit, right? Like, I'm not, mainly I'm not dressed warmly enough. I'm like, Mom, uh, she's like, but movies, they get so cold. They're so air conditioned. And I was like, I know, but that's why I have this cardigan, a little layering action. She's like, I know, but you, you're going to need more than that. That's not going to be enough. You need a coat. You need a coat. OK, it's August. Literally, it's August. But she's like, that's when they air condition it even more, which like, she's kind of right about. But it's like, I, I'm 28 years old. I don't need you to dress me. You know, I mean, I'm a grown up now. So I was like, Mom, I don't want to carry a coat. <laughs> oh, I don't want to carry it. So then she's like. Well, I'll carry it. I will carry it for you, please. It will make me feel better. At which point, I'm like, this is so ridiculous. What am I, like, I, OK, if you want to be my footman and carry it behind me, I would be a jerk to say no, right? Like, that's, a, that's I'm a bad child. 
So I'm like, all right, you can carry it for me. So <laughs> we go to the movie, we have fun. Then we go to the Best Buy and it has that little like after hours feel. Like when you're in school, after it closes, you wanna like run down the hall. So we're like a little giddy and we get our TV. And then we go to, I'm like, she's like, oh, how are we gonna get home? I was like, oh, we'll take a cab, mom, watch me. Hail the cab with my arm up, like, you know, Mary Tyler Moore. She's like, wow, look at you, hailing a cab. I love how moms are easy to impress, right? Like, it's kind of odd, at least mine, I, luck, I lucked out, right? Italian mothers are easy to impress. She's like, oh, you're such a real New Yorker. So we get it, I put it in the trunk, we get in the cab, we're having a great time, you know, chit chat. We get out of the cab, out of my apartment, say, say goodbye to the guy, tail lights in the way, I'm carrying the big TV. She's not carrying the coat. <laughs> no, it is in the cab, which has now disappeared around the corner. So we look at each other, she looks at me like this. <gasps> like a cowering animal, like we have a history of violence. Okay, like it looks, I was like, oh my God, mom, like what do you think I'm gonna do to you? Like I'm like, ah! So, so, so I'm like, oh mom, like it's okay, I totally, I totally forgot it too. I have left hundreds of things in cabs. No cab driver will ever have to wear, remember to buy an umbrella because I will leave my umbrella in every cab. So I was like, Mom, don't worry about it. I forgot it, too. And she goes, I know, but you didn't want to bring it. And I was like, I know, but he was thoughtful of you. You didn't want me to be cold, and I was cold, so I had it. And she goes, I know, but I was supposed to bring it back, and I forgot it. And I was like, Mom, it's OK. Like, don't worry. You're just thinking of me. And it really was touched. I mean, she was always felt so bad. And like, the coat was a gift from her. Anyway, it was like, so we just start hugging. We're like making all these girl sounds. My doorman is like, <laughs> ladies, ladies. But like, we're just like, we, you know, we had, I realized Honestly, that I was to blame for this reaction because this is clearly, you know, post-traumatic teenager disorder that she has, <laughs> of where I would have been taken any excuse to say I told you so, any excuse to be like, and you knew what? That was my most favorite coat. I love that. That was like the coat I was going to wear tomorrow. Um, so <laughs> clearly, like, I'm to blame, and I've seen where we've come, and so you know, we kind of we hug it out, and as if the universe is rewarding our new level of maturity, lo and behold, the cab comes back. Now that. I don't care how long you've lived in New York, that is a miracle, right? Okay? So, so then we're like rushed to the cab driver. We treat him like he's the subway hero. We're like, oh my God, thank you. My mom's trying to give him this big tip. He's gallantly refusing it, slash, totally gonna take it. We're like, oh, yes, thank you, thank you, so sweet. Like, the couple, the new couple in the back seat is like, yo, time, the meter, let's go, let's wrap this up. Now he and the doorman are like, oh, I know. <laughs> but you know, it really, it made me realize that we have grown. We've grown up together, we've changed together, and I'm glad that we can be in parallel lines, if not right together. So it's like, you know, it's the relationship is a work in progress, just like we all are. And um, it's just, it means so much to us to be able to share these stories with all of you. And it's really, I mean, we got to meet so many cool, funny, exciting, aspiring writers today in the workshop, or current writers who want to get to the next level, and what I really feel like I would say, I say to myself, is to just to go for it, to push through those fears and those obstacles that we put in our own way. Uh, some of the best writing advice I ever got was to give yourself permission to take yourself seriously, even if you're writing humor where you're not taking, you know, <laughs> the topics aren't serious, because I really feel that that is this wonderful, enduring legacy of Irma Bombeck, is that she, her writing and her stories and her voice really furthered and the legitimacy and the seriousness of the way we take women's voices and women's perspectives. And ironically, she did it through writing lighthearted, humorous, small clips of life. And it isn't important about what you're writing about or how you're writing about, but that it's yours and your voice and all of our voices together. It's important that they be heard and read and known. And that's why we're so happy to be part of that. And I'm so happy to get to meet you all to be a part of it too. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs>